instant color and instant gardening, but it's, it's really not very efficient, not sustainable. And at this time of the year, we're offered all these mums, and they are pretty, but they're from Asia. Um, and people try to plant them in Florida farther north. I mean, I spent 30 years in Maryland and before that in New England. And we could plant the mums, and they would come back year after year. But that's not going to happen in Florida. So um, <laughs> you can buy them. They're beautiful. But treat them as a bouquet. Don't, don't even try to plant them. But you might want to think about, you might want to think about getting a native aster, which is going to be beautiful in the fall and will last and will supply um, pollen to the pollinators and, and um, it belongs in our ecosystem where the mums do not. Now, TV gardening and, gar and garden magazine gardening often makes us want our landscape to be instantaneous. And this is, uh, this is a photos from uh, a house on my, on my road in my neighborhood from a few years ago. And they had brought in three truckloads full of dirt and they put up a mound and then they plants came in on a truck and the sod came in and by the end of the day they had a whole landscape voila there it is instant landscape um, but you know what's going to happen is that not all these plants are going to live some are going to become too vigorous and, and many of them will die but these people also had a problem because that three truckloads full of dirt that they put at the front of their yard um, when the rainy season began in the in the summertime it cha had changed the drainage pattern of their yard so that all the extra storm water went into that alcove and led into their kitchen so they took it all out took out the truckloads of dirt, <laughs> took out all those plants that they had paid probably thousands of dollars for and had to put in a, a different landscape. And then now they're even on a, a, a different one after that. Um, they did put in a drainage system in their front yard. But the, the problem with this type of thinking where the experts come in and they provide you with a whole landscape is that Landscaping is not an event. It's not the end. You plant all these plants. That is not the end. That's only the beginning of your adventures in this landscape. So um, it's, it's an ongoing um, situation. It's not an event. So we have to overcome that. Now, Doug Tallamy, I hope many of you have read this book, and he has a new book out called uh, Nature's Best Hope. He changed the way we can talk about native plants. He's an entomologist, professor um, at the University of Delaware, and he has changed the whole narrative of how we think about our landscapes, because if we don't have natives, then we won't have the caterpillars. And if we don't have the caterpillars, then we won't have the birds. So he said that our plants need to be more than just pretty. They need to be part of the ecosystem. And his research has shown that even a home landscape can make a difference to birds and to insects and pollinators. Um, and of course, if more of us plant natives, then our whole neighborhood can become a working ecosystem. Uh, and the answer to his question on the next book, where he says, nature's best hope, the answer to that is us. We are nature's best hope. We are the ones who have the power to change the way we think about our landscapes and how they should be supporting the ecosystem and supplying ecosystem services. So we want native landscapes to attract insects, which feed the birds. Uh, some insects are more well known and well talked about, like monarchs, uh, than others. But they're all important. 
and we can put in a variety of plants. And here in Florida, we should have something blooming in our yards year round, because even in the winter, there are warm days. And so some butterflies and moths may come out of dormancy on those warm days and they need, they're going to need some nectar. So we can put in native plants that um, will provide them with food for themselves. Um, so th those are the reasons. Now, I'm not going to spend very much time on that because this is a Native Plant Society chapter. So we're assuming that you're already on board. And here's how we go native. So the Florida Native Plant Society. And if you're listening from somewhere else, there are native plant societies all over um, the country. So support the native plant societies because we want to make natives the new normal, not the plants from other places. And here in Florida, we're lucky because we have the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. And so you can go to plantrealflorida.org to find a local nursery near you or to find a plant and who has a plant, a particular plant for sale. And if you go to the tool in the, in the um, Native Plant Society, if you go to this tool, plants, um, when you look up a plant profile, it will have a link to the fan site for that plant so that you have how what the plant will need as far as moisture you'll have whether it's a whether it's a uh, a uh, support supporting the pollinators uh, things you need to look out for and that kind of thing so um, all of this is on our website and yes it's a new it's a new website and the and the um, the plant database is one of our most important part of our of our website and i have to say that i am proud to be a team member on that and right now i am going through my all my old photos and putting um making them square and uploading them to shirley denton who is putting it together and updating all the plants and these plant profiles so a lot of work goes into that so really what you're doing here is you're planning for wildlife. Um, and this caterpillar here is a sphinx moth. It was eating a, a, a primrose, um, actually the invasive primrose willow. Um, but we need to invite butterflies and other pollinators to the yard, including the larval forms, which are the caterpillars. So in order to do that, we have no poisons, no poisons. Um, you could use integrated pest management to control bugs if you're doing vegetable gardens um, that would encourage the predators and would um, discourage the pests. But if you're not growing vegetables, actually, you want your plants to be eaten. And as I, as I said before, the National Wildlife Federation has a uh, certification for your yard. And I, I went through that. Uh, one of the first things that I did, we moved into the house. And that's my sign out at the front, at the front of the lot is that my yard is a uh, wildlife habitat. So, when you don't have pesticides, this is what happens. You get caterpillars. And the, these white and black caterpillars are our zebra longwing, our zebra longwing caterpillars. They'll, they, they'll mature into our state butterfly, the zebra longwing. And you need to have passion vine, passion vine uh, plants um, for them. The natives are best. So when you see that your passion vine is being eaten, then a real butterfly gardener will cheer when their plants are being eaten. How often we see on 
social media and, and other places that, okay, so you don't use poisons. You could put together this homemade remedy. And I have edited this meme. They said, oh, look, it's, it's made out of vinegar and salt. And so, you know, it's not poison, but it is. The vinegar and the salt is poison. It, and if you spray this on a pile of weeds in the back of, of your garden or something like that, it will kill the toads or the frogs and the worms. It'll kill the soil microbes. And the salt and vinegar will not only kill the plants that are in place there, that will kill new plants too. This is not eco-friendly, even though it's homemade. Um, don't fall for this. Um, a poison is a poison is a poison. And on my on my website, I have uh, a lot of information about that. If it's poisonous for one thing, it's poisonous for other things. So people um, spray soapy mixtures on their plants to get rid of aphids. But when they do that, then they are also killing the ladybug larvae and and the other predators that would also be there. So we don't want to use um, something that's going to kill one thing because it will kill others. Also, the soapy mixtures that is so widely recommended will also melt the waxy cuticle on the plants. And so that would make your plants more vulnerable to attack by the aphids and other herbiv herbivores and it will also make the plants more uh, susceptible to wilting. So that soap um, that, that you might put on plants that people recommend is, is harmful, not only for the bugs, but also hurts your plants. So when I put together this book, when I, when I said, okay, so how this is my third book. So, so when I put it together, first my first book was Sustainable Gardening for Florida, and then I did a vegetable gardening book for Florida. But this one uh, was specific for people who didn't know how to, how to um, have a sustainable situation with natives that, you know, all the advice sort of stops where you put them in and, and you'll be fine because they're native, they belong here. And that's the end of the advice. So I continued it on, um, did a lot of research. So the first thing you'd want to do is create some kind of a plan. Um, and actually, in my fourth gardening book, the step-by-step um, -step guide to a Florida native yard, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, we, did, we did a plan. So that's really the, an extension of this book. Then you have to decide what to keep and what to get rid of. If you have invasive plants, and this is not aggressive, but invasive plants, plants that are causing problems in the wild areas here in Florida, you need to get rid of those first. I talked about how you plant stuff so that it would actually do well. And one of the biggest problems or situations is managing the edges of your wild areas when it comes into a more tame area. So I talked at great length about how you manage the edge of your wild garden or your meadow or whatever so that it looks like you did this on purpose and so that people are not going to say, wow, it's just a pile of weeds. So there, there's ways to um, design your landscape so that it doesn't become uh, an eyesore to people who don't see all the pollinators, they just see overgrown plants. So there's ways to do that so that it becomes more acceptable. Um, and we'll get into groves in a minute and hedgerows. And I, I'm, I'm not gonna talk too much about rain gardens here, but I have articles on these on, on my blog. And then the other thing that your native landscape will do is it might inspire others. And we all can be native plant enthusiasts and become native plant enthusiasts and help our neighbors plant um, more natives and will want to plant more natives. So inspiring others 
in our neighborhood and in our community is, is something that is important for us because it's not just one yard. Um, we all can make a difference because there's millions and millions of gardeners um, and we can make a difference. All right. So here is a plan ahead kind of thing. This is in my county, in Clay County, along a divided road in Orange Park. And what, what they did now is they planted longleaf pines, not right under those wires, but pretty close to them. And so this was taken when they were first planted. Um, you can still see that they're staked. Now they actually have reached as high as those, as, as those uh, power lines and they are being trimmed on one side. So the, the thing that, I mean, we need, you need to look up and you need to say, how big is this going to get? And, it, and you have to know what's under the ground as well. So planning ahead is um, an important part of making your landscape sustainable so that you have enough room, that those roots are not going to disturb your sewer pipes or your underground power lines or anything like that. You need to know where um, where your infrastructure is. Um, so plan ahead so that you, you don't have your, <laughs> your trees that the best scenario for these trees is that they will be half, they'll be half cut and there'll only be one side of the tree that's allowed to grow. Or they'll have to be cut down because this is just not the right place to put these plants. And what bothers me more than anything probably is that the people who are managing this road will say, well, we tried native plants and they just didn't work. But it isn't because they're native, it's because they didn't plan ahead. All right, now, sort of the opposite of what we're offered in big box stores and other garden centers is the ideal time to plant a, a tree or a shrub is when it's dormant. And so this is a beauty berry, even though it looks like a stick. And so this is really an excellent time to, to plant this because it will be have a much higher success rate of, uh, of uh, lasting long because it's not supporting leaves right now. And it's small. And, but you do have to plan ahead because that beauty berry could be like 12 feet across with arching branches. So don't plant it on the edge of a sidewalk. So if you're working at uh, plant sales or if you're going to a native nursery, sometimes they have these, these their plants in full bloom like, like these tropical sage, the, um, the salvia coccinea. Um, some are pink and some are red and it's a beautiful native. So people who say that natives aren't pretty, look at this, it's just fantastic. And these reseed and once you have one, you'll have a whole bunch. Um, but if you're buying them when they're dormant, be sure that you look for information, do your homework so that you know how big it's going to get, you'll know whether it needs wet or dry or, or whatever else. So you need to think about what you're doing and this is part of your planning. Because if you buy something and it needs to be wet, and you don't have any wet places, then it's going to die. So you need to plan ahead for that. All right, and this is one of my favorite pollinator plants. This is the snow square stem. And I have it planted right out my front door here. And if I need to get away and need a moment in nature, I can just walk out my front door during the daylight when the, when the sun is out. And these flowers will be covered with butterflies and bees and wasps and flies and all kinds of things. So it's the, it is a wonderful 
pollinator plant, but it gets kind of rangy. It gets to be like five or six feet tall and it falls over into the path and it reseeds vigorously. So you need to know what to expect. You can trim them back. And that's what I do if it's next to a path, um, then I trim them back. Um, and if it's reseeds in the middle of the path or where I don't want it, I dig it up and put it in a pot and sell it to somebody else so they can get started with their own snow square stem. I started with one plant <laughs> that I bought uh, at, a yard, at, at a plant sale from our chapter and now I've got hundreds of them. Um, but I, I do, you do need to know what to expect. And, and here's another native that is messy and weedy and will reseed itself. But pollinators love the Spanish needles or the beggar's ticks as it's called, the Biden's alba. Um, and if you have a spot of dirt that is not have anything growing on it and it doesn't have any mulch over it, you will end up with these because it is a pioneer plant. And so you need to know that. Um, I would leave, I leave these in the back, in the back corners of our, of our yard. We have a, an acre and a half, so it's not a village size lot. Um, but I have, I have harvested bushels of these because they are so aggressive and I want other plants to grow too. But you need to appreciate what they do for the pollinators. And, and the, these insects right here are uh, the polka dotted wasp moths, which are native to Florida. Um, and I love their, their gun meadow blue bodies and their white polka dots and their red abdomen. Um, and they use a member of a dog bane family as their larval food source. But 500 years ago, when Spanish missionaries started bringing in oleander, which is also in the dog bane family, they switched to the oleander. So now they're called the oleander worm. Um, and they are very vigorous in eating the oleanders. Um, and they live now anywhere in North America, except California, where the oleanders are growing. So they have made the switch uh, to an alien, an alien plant, but it's in the same family. But it is a good pollinator plant. It's just going to be messy and weedy. So you need to know that. And you just need to leave it in a back corner where it can do what it needs to do. All right, and also part of planning ahead, and as I mentioned before, for with the with the beautyberry, don't buy large trees. This is a magnolia. It's a native plant, although this is probably one of the cultivars. But don't buy this tree. It has been topped, and when you top a tree, you shorten its life. And it was topped because gardening experts have said, well, buy the bushiest plant you can find. And so when you top it, then it, it sprouts new growth. So there are three leaders there, but this is not good for the plant. And it's too big. The diameter of the trunk is three inches and the, uh, the, it's called a caliper. Um, and that's at six inches above the root flare. So it's too big. It's going to be root browned. It costs a lot of money. You're much better off buying a much smaller tree, a much smaller magnolia um, that is going to adjust much more quickly, will take a lot less care, and uh, will catch up to this tree in probably just two years or so. Um, so don't buy the large trees. Although expert gardening advice says they'll buy the largest tree you can afford. Don't do it. Buy the small trees. Wait, wait for it because it's a long-term investment. 
And here's another controversial thing, um, because we didn't know this before. Um, rinsing all the growth media away from a container grown tree. Now this is not field grown trees that are transplanted, trees that are being transplanted, but trees that are grown in containers, you need to rinse all the growing media away from them. And you need to spread out the roots because the roots will be winding in the, in the pot and you need to spread them out as far as you can. Now this is this is a tough love for this tree, um, and you're going to have to irrigate the heck out of it for uh, weeks because you will have taken all the root hairs away, and it will it will need a lot of irrigation. You do not prune a tree though; you rinse the roots, but do not prune anything unless a branch is broken off. Don't prune it for shaping for at least a year or two because the tree needs energy and where does it get its energy it gets its energy from its leaves where there's photosynthesis taking place so you need to water the heck out of it so uh, a one inch caliper which is what this tree was in the in the picture should probably have a three gallon watering can full of water uh, every day for several weeks, then maybe several times a week, and then you 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 uh, taper off. So you'd put you'd build a berm around it so that the water would stay there, and you so you do water it. You do not have any enrichment in the planting hall at all. No no fertilizer, no peat moss, no compost, no nothing in the planting hole. You want the tree to get used to your lousy soil. And the faster it gets used to that lousy soil, the better it is because the roots will then go out and that makes the root, makes the tree more drought tolerant and more wind tolerant. So this is, this is not the traditional gardening advice. Um, because that soil that is in, or the non-soil probably that's in that container is very rich. It probably has fertilizer balls, it's pine bark, it's peat moss, it's all kinds of rich stuff. And so if you leave all that rich growing medium in the planting hole, the roots will continue to wander around. You don't want that, you want the roots to go out. So what, what you would do is then fertilize outside with compost, outside the planting hole, so you entice the roots to grow outward, not stay in the planting hole area. So now if you're planting a tree, and, and to some extent this is for large shrubs as well. This is not the advice for like perennial plants or anything, you might spread the roots out, but you don't have to rinse the roots away if it's just a herbaceous plant. So here's my own story. In 2010, I was on my first book tour and I ended up with a winged elm. It was in a three gallon pot, but it had been kept in a one gallon pot for much too long. And so it was a surprise to see the red roots and that also that they were winding much tighter than the pot that was put in. So I rinsed the roots. I actually had to break or crack one of those branches to get it straightened out. And I, wa I, and I watered it like crazy and I put compost around the outside of the hole farther and farther away so that the, so that it was, um, the, the roots would grow outward. And now 10 years later, here is the tree today. So um, it's, it's more than 20 feet tall. It's done very well. Um, so that, that's the story of my winged elm. All right, and here's an illustration of why you want to end those circling roots. Because if you don't, this is what's going to happen. So this is not in Florida. These are copper beaches. I think this is in Oregon or California. And so when this was planted, 
and you can still see the plastic orange webbing. They probably kept it in the webbing because look, it's between the sidewalk and the street. So they didn't want the roots to go out. But now 15 or 20 years later, and the person who planted it thought they really probably did a really good job because look how magnificent these trees are. But the trees are killing themselves because the roots were not rinsed and they were not encouraged to grow outward. And this is what happens. So this is why you want to bear root and do the root rinsing of the trees. All right, so here is a sable miner that somebody gave to me. And I put compost around the edge, probably a little too close. Um, and this is how you enrich the soil. And then the next time you do it out a little farther. And the next time you do it out a little farther because what you want, and you don't dig in the compost, you just leave it there. You can put mulch on top of it, but don't dig in the compost. The, the soil and the, and the soil microbes will figure out um, how, how to absorb themselves into the soil. And so um, that, that's how you enrich um, or encourage a, a native plant in, in a habitat. But if the native habitat is nutrient poor, don't do this very long or very much. You just maybe want to do it once or twice to give the roots a head start, but don't enrich the soil too much because that's not the, not the normal ecosystem. All right. All right, and again, this is my front yard and that, and that azalea that's on the cover of the book is right here near this. Um, holly tree. So I had, uh, th this whole area here was sodded and was all being mown when we bought the house in 2004. So this was, you know, quite a few years later and we had a tongue of grass that went in. So th this was one of the edging projects that I did. Um, and so what you want is you want an easy to mow edge no vertical siding next to the lawn so that the person who's mowing the lawn, and in our case, it's my husband, can just make a, a clean sweep of the mower, never having to come back with a string trimmer. That's the kind of edge management you want. You want it easy to mow um, and no use of other tools. Now, I want you to notice the Elliott love grasses here. This was the second year, and the next year they died. So I had put these together as a beautiful edge for my, my partial meadow here. Then the year after they died, I met up with David Chiappini, who is a native plant wholesaler, and I knew that he was the one who had supplied my native nursery with her plants. So I, I, he was at, a, at another show, another plant show. And I said, so David, my Elliot's love grasses, they died, what should I do? What can I do about that? And he said, don't plant them there again. So that is probably, <laughs> that's probably the best advice and the clearest advice that I can give you. All right, they should have worked fine. From what I knew about the Elliott Scloff grass, this was a fine place for it. The soil was sort of rich, it was, it was moist, it should have done very well. But David said, don't plant it there again because we don't really know. It's a guessing game. So your best teacher on maintaining your landscape is the landscape, it will tell you. So I don't have love grasses there anymore. I've got some muley grasses and actually I've taken out more of that lawn. Um, so the tongue of lawn is even shorter now. So that um, <clears throat> I've got some yeah, muley grasses and some other stuff there. So the meadow has been enlarged, but don't plant it there again 
was is my favorite advice. All right. So we're in the villages, and this is a photo I took uh, in the villages a number of years ago. And I took it because it's, it illustrates Now, the magnolia is a beautiful tree. It's a beautiful native tree. This is a beautiful specimen. But the magnolias, the, this magnolia, now the sweet bay magnolia doesn't do this, but the, the southern magnolia, the magnolia grandiflora, drops its large leathery leaves all year round. So this is a maintenance nightmare. They don't mow very well. I mean, so you probably have to rake the yard before you mow. And then in addition, this person here has a vertical edge with a, the metal around the gravel and he's got gravel. So the lawnmower could launch the gravel out, <laughs> injure somebody, break a window. Um, it's a maintenance nightmare. Now, if you look at the next door neighbor over here, he shouldn't be using red, red dyed mulch, but okay, we'll give him that. But what he has is pavers. So the people who are doing the mowing here just have to go around. They don't have any vertical edges. It's an easy curve. They can mow around the yard, the yard very easily. So here's the nightmare and here is not. So this is just a good illustration of how you can do that. But what if you already have this magnolia? Because it is a default lawn tree. <laughs> well, here's, here's Marjorie Shropshire was the illustrator for the Art of Maintaining a Florida Native Landscape. And th this is, I asked her to do a grove around a magnolia. So what you would do is draw the line of your grove around the tree so that it includes the whole leaf drop area. So all where all those leaves dropped, make sure that that is within your area, your, your grove area. In a small yard like, like um, that, that one, you would not really have room for another tree, but you could put some tall shrubs in the back area here. So we have Walter's viburnum and sparkleberries. So we would want uh, shrubs here that um, are compatible with the acid loving magnolia tree. Um, there's all kinds of things you could do to make this uh, look good, but one of the big advantages for you as far as maintenance goes is that you won't have to rake up those darn leaves. The leaves then become mulch for these plants, these acid-loving plants that would be happy to have magnolia leaves around them. Now suppose you have a crepe myrtle in your front yard. This is actually in my backyard. Well, uh, crepe myrtles are, the Floridians have a terrible problem with, mag, with the crepe myrtles because they chop them off at about seven feet where they can be reached so that they bloom out um, and they have all these sprouts right at the same level and the blooms are large and, and the, the plant gets uh, mutilated every year. Um, so this was in our backyard and we, we cut off a lot of those sprouts, but left some of them, the biggest ones. And so now we have a very nice tree. Now, if you were to build a grove around a crepe myrtle, because this is not native. This is native to, most of them are native to India. Some are native to other parts of Asia. Um, you may have a long-term plan where you leave the crepe myrtle because it's cooling the atmosphere, it adds stature, uh, people, the birds can use it, it looks nice. Um, but you may plant other trees around it that and you may eventually chop down the crepe myrtle. So you would plan ahead for native trees that you would plant around it in a grove. 
So the, the, um, the goal here might be different. All right, the other thing about a grove instead of a single tree is that as far as habitat goes, a group of trees and shrubs is going to provide much better habitat. But also as far as hurricane scaping, a group of trees is far more stable than a single tree growing by itself. So if you want to reduce your maintenance, it would be good not to have it topped off by a hurricane. And you can do that by having a bunch of trees instead of just one. All right, and you, you need to remember that your landscape is not an arboretum. This is in my neighborhood. And this guy planted one of all kinds of trees here. This is not what you want to do. You want to group them so that they form some kind of good habitat and you don't have to mow around each one, just the whole group. So you reduce the mowing, increase the habitat, increase the wind resistance, uh, better cooling, um, all that, all that, because a grouping of plants is what you're, what you're after. And I love the idea of the hedgerows. This is in my neighborhood, so it's going to have some plants that you're not going to be able to grow down there. This is an oak leaf hydrangea in bloom. But there are azaleas in here, there's beauty berries, and they're all planted in a, such a way so that they do not have to be trimmed. So that each of the shrubs, and, and you could even have small trees, takes on its own shape so that you don't have to trim the damn hedge all the time. So there are all kinds of different native shrubs that you could grow in a hedgerow for privacy or, or whatever, in your, probably in the villages in your backyard. Um, but the hedgerows are something that um, is very British. And there are enough hedgerows in Britain, in Great Britain, that it can circumnavigate the globe twice with all the hedgerows. <laughs> Just a little bit of trivia for you. So the question is, doesn't everyone want to support Mother Nature? Doesn't everyone want to be a good steward of our only planet? So what we have to do as native plant people, native plant enthusiasts, is work to convince other people that supporting the hummingbirds, and this is a coral honeysuckle, um, and it, it's, a, it's a beautiful native, easy, easy to grow, and look who comes. This is, this is a photo I took from my kitchen window, and so we love watching the hummingbirds. And right now, this has gone to berry. There's not very many flowers on this one, but there's some other ones that still have flowers. So the hummingbirds are now going to the scarlet sage uh, instead. So if you're speaking with other people, and I always speak at my Clay County delegation. So in the fall, after the election, the rep state representatives that um, represent Clay County have, have an open forum meeting and you get three minutes. So anybody can come in and speak. So when you do, or when you're talking to county officials or you're talking to anybody else, these are the rules of peas. And this first came from Eleanor Dietrich, who is a Native Plant Society member, and, and uh, she worked actually for the Florida Wildlife Federation. The rule of P is be prepared, be polite, uh, be on time, be punctual, um, because you, you don't want to argue with people. You want to win them over to your side. Um, and so all of these suggestions here um, are ways to make progress. Because if you start yelling and you get angry because somebody doesn't understand what you're trying to do, then you are not making progress. So you want to deliver praise for even the slightest uh, advance that they might be making. 
And so we need to get out there and speak. Um, and it's important. And, and you may think that, I mean, Clay County is a very Republican county uh, and all my representatives are Republicans, but they do listen. And actually a new piece of legislation came because I spoke in front of the Clay County delegation about uh, allowing uh, vegetable gardens in front yards. And so there was a case pending at the time uh, in Miami Shores where um, the town or the city tore out some, some a woman's vegetable garden. So she was suing. And so I talked about this. And then the next year, there is now a law in Florida. It says that it's sort of a double negative law. It says that towns and municipalities can no longer ban vegetable gardening in the front yard. So it's more of a personal freedom thing. I think that was the key for them, but that is now a law. And so people can grow vegetable gardens in their front yards. Now it doesn't cover HOAs, but with this law in place, more people can grow, can grow vegetables. So do they listen? Sometimes I guess is the answer. Now, uh, Marjorie and I wrote, as I said, the step-by-step -step guide to a Florida native yard. And as part of that book, we promised to have a PowerPoint. And you may recognize the landscape in our, on the front page of our PowerPoint, it's Steve Turnipseed's uh, yard, um, about why native landscapes are important. This is free to download. It's about 10 minutes. There is a um, script for you. So if you read the script, it's about 10 minutes. And um, you go to the resources page on our website and you go to downloadable documents and it's on the lower left-hand corner. It says, Why Natives Jenny Steibolt. And when you download it, it's a PowerPoint, but if you open the PowerPoint, not if it's not a PowerPoint, it's a PDF, but when you open the PDF, there is a link to download the PowerPoint so that you can use this for talking to garden clubs, any other organization. This is, this is one of the ways that we want to make it easy for you to help make natives the new normal. So, um, please use it. It's, that's what we put it together for. All right, so um, we can all make a difference. Now in this book, 50% of the royalties of this book, and you can buy it uh, from my website there, greengardeningmatters.com, 50% gets paid to the Native Plant Society. Now the other thing <laughs> I am on the conference committee for the Native Plant Society, and the conference was supposed to be in Jacksonville this year, which was canceled. I'm still on the committee, and we've decided that the conference in May is going to be virtual. I mean, it may be safe for us to get together then, but we are not spending the money for a hotel and everything like that, um, because it may not it may not be safe. So it's going to be virtual and we're going to be asking or encouraging every chapter to participate with a PowerPoint or a video or something cool that you've done. Then this is something that we can do virtually that we couldn't do if we were in person. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, questions. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, you ready? Okay, now here I am. Can you hear me, Ginny? Yes, I can. Okay, so um, the first question that somebody put in was, um, it's regarding your winged elm. And it said, did you trim your winged elm roots or spread them out when you planted it? Uh, I, I had to break one of those circling roots because it was too woody. So it just sort of got folded back and I spread them out. 
Yeah. Now the tree was a mess. It had all kinds of sprouts. It had been topped. It was a mess, but I did not trim any part of the upper part of that tree for a year and a half. Wow. So then, and then it took like three years to get one liter um, and to cut off all the sprouts, but it's a very nice looking tree now. Oh, great. Um, uh, also, if people think of questions while Ginny's answering, you can type those in as well and we'll get to those. Um, I have another question that somebody submitted to me um, prior to the meeting. And um, they, have, they live in the villages and they have uh, a front area like right at their entryway and they are able to plant ground cover on both sides. And they tried um, Pineland Lantana, but then that got nematodes. So then they planted something else that was non-native and they believe that that got nematodes as well. And so they um, are asking if you, can recommend a plant that either um, won't be susceptible to that, or do you have any suggestions? Okay, I have two suggestions for ground covers. Okay. But if you have a nematode problem, yeah. um, and we covered this in our vegetable book, if you have a nematode problem, um, the solution in a vegetable garden is to plant a cover crop of marigolds and dig them under. So if you have a bad root knot nematode problem, yeah. you could plant marigold seeds for the summer and then dig them under and that would reduce the nematodes. But the two ground covers that I would suggest would be the uh, fog, fog fruit, yep. Phyla nautifora, yep. um, and uh, the sunshine mimosa, the mimosa strigolosa. And those are both native and you can actually plant them together. Um, they, they work okay together, but the mimosa is a legume, which means that it can fix nitrogen so it can grow in poor soil. Oh, thank you very much. Sure. And uh, Jean has a comment to everyone and it was regarding the magnolia tree. Yeah. She said if the people hadn't trimmed from the bottom of the magnolia, the leaves wouldn't be a problem. There would be no maintenance. And what do you have any comments on that? Because I'm not picturing is this, she just talking about it would just that it would be so wide it would be at the ground. There would be leaves like branches on the ground. Is, yeah, if you have one that has branches all the way to the ground, I would leave it. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because okay. because then it's a coverage all the way to the ground. You won't have to worry about the leaves; they'll just fall in there. Um, but if you have one that's been trimmed up, yeah. and that is the the native way that they would do that, the the branches would go right down to the ground. But if you have one that's been trimmed up, then the leaves will cause a um, a maintenance nightmare if it's in a lawn. And okay. so that's why you you would build a, a, a grove around the tree as large as the leaf drop area. So when the darn leaves drop, they drop into that grove area and you won't have to rake them up. That's a great idea. Okay, mm -hmm. Barbara has a question and she says, what time of year is a good time to transplant and establish a bush, spring or fall or any other time? And she's just uh, talk, talking generically. Generically, I plant them now. Okay. Plant, plant them now. Um, many of the plants are in a semi-dormant state. Plant them now. Um, it's the end of our wet season. It's going to be the dry season coming up, but it is semi-dormant. And in the villages, you have a lot of uh, snowbirds, so they're only there in the winter time. <laughs> so right. plant, plant it when you're there so that you can water it um, and take care of it. Okay. Um, also, um, some people think because a plant is native that you can just plant it and it's going to be fine. Um, can you please talk about the care they need at the beginning um, and they said that you touched on that, but could you elaborate a little bit? Right. 
So a plant is a plant, it's not plastic. Whether it's native or not, you're gonna to have to take care of it. And it is a rude uh, situation that you've put your plants into to plant them in your yard. So this is a shock to the plant so that they will need a lot of water and they will need um, mulch on top of the soil, but not next to the plant. Mm -hmm. And for mulch, um, I'd recommend something that's not dyed. Uh, pine needle mulch is good because it doesn't cake up um, so that the water can get through it. The volcano mulching is a no-no and mm -hmm. yeah, because that will cause all kinds of problems. And you see this a lot in, professionally <laughs> monitored landscapes where you they pile up the mulch around the trunk of the tree. So you want to have the root flare of a tree above the soil line and out in the open. Um, and a tree that's too deep will not live as long as one that's higher. Uh, so that don't let your, tr let your tree go too deep into the soil. The root flare, which is where the roots right. start, have to, has to be above the soil line. Right. Um, but yeah, you're going to have to water, you're going to have to mulch, make sure that it doesn't dry out. And the plant will tell you if it's wilting, so you may have to, when you first plant it, water it a couple times a day. All right, thank you. I think that clarifies that. Um, Patty wants to know, um, she says she's got wild grass growing in her yard and it's popping up in a variety of spots. She said the largest one is more than five feet tall. Is it worth using as a landscape plant? And she doesn't know what kind of grass. It's just uh, <laughs> five yeah. foot grass. If it's it might be a pampas grass or something that's mm -hmm. that's not native. Uh, there's not very many native Florida grasses that grow that large. Yeah. Um, so um, it's probably not native. Well, is that a picture of it there? <laughs> is there? No, I don't see a picture. Yeah, I think she's showing it. Oh, she is? Yeah. Uh, if you do gallery view, you can. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I can't tell from here. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't think it's native. It out, yeah. I know Fakahatchee grass grows really tall, but that's not Fakahatchee. Yeah, the Fakahatchee grass, which in the rest of the world is called gamma, Eastern gamma grass, easier to spell. Um, and it's also called sweet grass. And so the sweet grass baskets are actually the Fakahatchee grass so that you, you, can, you can use it for basket weaving. Um, but yeah, that, that grows to probably about three or three and a half feet in the, and that will, it's salt tolerant. It will, it will grow in a wet area or grow in a wild, in a, in a not wet area. So the, that Fakahatchee grass is a really nice grass to have. And um, I actually have several, um, shrubs of the dwarf facts fact yeah. to just because of the space in my yard that's what I needed right. but um, I was surprised one thing I didn't understand is that when they bloom um, the butterflies and the insects really enjoy those blooms so they do. yeah yeah so um, Linda wants to know she says pruning shrubs is her problem where she lived before, pruning was done only one time a year. Can we pr prune any time here? Um, also, she's got Pineland Lantana, Walters by Vernon, or anything else that you can think of. So those are the kind of plants that she's talking about. Well, the, you can... You can prune more than once a year, but probably the plant would appreciate it if you only did, <laughs> only did it once a year, if you can manage that. Um, so, but if it's in the way, um, then you could chop it back, but it would probably be best to do it uh, in the fall um, so that it can grow back for the spring. And so, it, you know, if it's gonna bloom in the spring and that kind of thing, it'd be better to, to have it be pruned in the fall. 
Okay. You know what I found is because I have Pineland Lantana and a little tidbit of advice that Steve Turnipseed gave me is he said every once in a while when you're walking by just go into the bottom and just trim like one of the branches like pretty close to the ground because otherwise it for mine they were getting kind of woody and lanky and I didn't want that look I wanted them to be more full so that's my strategy for pineland lantana Right. And you can do that also with the beauty berry where you can cut off a third of the branches almost to the ground and then you would end up with new new branches because it blooms and gets berries on new growth. Mm -hmm. So you could cut one third of the branches each year. And okay. then and then the next year you take another third and then another third so that you you would be able to keep it a little bit smaller if you had a tight landscape. Okay, and we have um, Barbara has, uh, and pardon me if I don't pronounce it correctly, but Xenoxylum, Xenothylum, Xenoxylum, anyway, Z-A-N-T-H-O-X-Y-L-U-M, Fagra, and it's called Lime Prickly Lass is what she calls it. She said it's not putting out new leaves. She thinks it's dying. Should she dig it up? and try it somewhere else or just accept fate? <laughs> <laughs> well, gar gardeners are like the gamblers, you know, and you, you've got to know when to fold. Um, <laughs> and then if it's not working, so like my Elliot's love grass, you say, okay, I'll do something else here. Uh, so you could transplant it, it might be that particular spot, try again in another place, but you know, if a plant is only eking by, take it out, yeah. you know, and, and put and put in something else. I mean, that, and again, your landscape is your teacher um, that you will learn from your landscape. And that's the thing that is the real lesson here is that there is no one way to do this. It's up to you. <laughs> and and it's also you know what your particular situation is in your landscape because it's what I do here in Clay County is not necessarily going to translate to the villages or anywhere right. else. So Mary Lou is new to magnolias and wants to know are they supposed to be trimmed? We sort of covered on that but um not really. I mean, if you can, if you can leave the branches, they will grow down to the ground and it will be a beautiful habitat area that you won't have to maintain at all. Once you trim them up so that they become more tree-like for a lawn, which is how most of them are sold, um, then, then you end up with some some trimming that is needed um, to so that you can get underneath it for uh, working on your grove or whatever but you don't they don't need it okay um there's so you know what in my yard we have behind our house there's a magnolia tree um, that's not ours but it blows leaves on our property and my strategy is I pick them up and use them for mulch in my yard. They'll get crackly and I crackle them up and just yep. put them in the yard because I, I actually like them and I, you know, don't fight it where our neighbor, she's got grass and she's just always wanting them off of her grass. So I tell her if she feels like picking hers up and throwing them my way, I won't ever mind. So that's <laughs> yeah, well, the, you know, mother nature gives us all kinds of gifts. This morning I was out, on the street raking up pine needles <laughs> because there's a lot of pines in our neighborhood and so i rake up pine needles and i use them for mulch yeah see so that, that way i don't have they don't have to buy anything it's a good exercise people stop and say what the heck are you doing <laughs> or they say oh my gosh isn't it aren't you being nice uh, sweeping the streets for us i said yeah right <laughs> So Deidre has invasive guinea grass that's also a big problem. And 
um, wants to know, I, well, she just said, I have guinea grass that's also a big problem in my gardens. So I, I mean, if it's a problem, I would probably just um, pull it. But what, do you have any suggestions, Jenny? Um, I don't have that grass, so um, I don't have any personal experience with it. But if you want to really kill it, I'd pull it out. If it comes back again, uh, you could solarize. Okay. Um, there all the plants, or you or you could use, you know, the vinegar and the and the salt, and that will kill it. But it will also, you know, just be careful with it because it is a poison. All right. Margaret has a hedge of Walter's viburnum densa. Last year, two of them started turning brown. She cut them off. They returned to looking healthy and beautiful. And now one of them is really starting to turn brown again. Yeah. Um, she's wondering if that's what will happen to all the Walters by Burnham's. Um, it sounds like a, there's some kind of environmental problem there. Okay. I, it shouldn't be turning brown, I don't think. So, do you, so it would be a problem maybe, um, do you think if she, took it to the master gardener plant clinic or showed them maybe they could help her they were doing virtual master gardeners uh plant clinics okay. in the villages and i know you can um actually take your device out to your plant if you have that capability i know that will work in in the villages or you can take a photograph of it and they can um yeah the, ma the master gardeners are a good source um and your agriculture agent is a good source of information for local knowledge. Um, and some of our master gardeners are, um, myself included, are native plant enthusiasts. So, and we do have clinics on Mondays and Fridays, Zoom clinics. That's so, good. Yeah. Oh, um, can you elaborate on leaving some areas untouched for insects to winter over in? Yes. Um, you know, seventy percent of our native bees, and that doesn't include the honeybee, ground or ne ground nesters, and so they need unmulched, unplanted um, soil, and they they are in the wasps also do this where they, they capture insects and caterpillars and stuff and drag them down into the, into the nest, lay eggs on them, and then cover them over and the new, um, new bees or the wasps come out. So yeah, you'd want to have some ground that is not mulched and not planted. And this would be in an area where maybe you'd have a stick pile um, so that it would be contained in one back, one, one back area so that it would be maybe around it, you would have shrubs. <laughs> so be in the center of a shrub area so that nobody needs to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, so that that way you could have a wild area. There was, there was one gal in Florida who had a, had a movement called the back 10 feet. She said, well, you leave the back 10 feet wild hmm. well, of your yards. Not a bad idea. Sometimes I know in my yard, I only have 10 feet to the rear. <laughs> but, um, but I do leave a lot of it overwintering after I learned that the, um, you know, I just don't disturb, disturb the soil at all back there during the winter at all. Well, that, that, that's right. And you, they need hollow sticks. And yeah, you could buy a, a bee hotel and stuff like that that's pre-made, but they really um, need reeds and other natural things, which is why you have a stick pile back there so that they can overwinter in the leaves and in the sticks and, and do what they would normally do so that you can help them complete their life cycles. Um, there's all kinds of, of things that you can do to promote that. Um, one, one thing I've, we put in the book here is that you could actually take a, 
a dead log, put it upright so it could become a snag. And that way it would attract the bugs who would be after the dead wood and then that attracts the woodpeckers. And so it becomes a habitat area and you could arrange them artfully so that they're like a bouquet. So there'd be three different heights or something so that they, <laughs> again, so it would look like you did it on purpose. You could put a yeah, birdhouse on top of it, happy. something like that. All right. Well, that is the, that was the final question. I also posted a link, another link at, um, for your um, Green Garden Gardening Matters blog spot. So it's a clickable link for anybody that wants to just click on it and go. Otherwise, you could type it into your browser. Right. But if you go to green resources on my blog, that's where there's links to hundreds of articles that I've written. Um, so that, and there are, if you want, if you want to know about integrated pest management, there's a, there's several articles there. If you want to know about compost and mulching, there's the, there, I've arranged them according to topic. Uh, so, um, and there's one, there's a whole bunch of them on native plants. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jenny. This was uh, phenomenal. Yes, I thank you so much. Information. And thank you, Julie, for uh, those questions. And thanks, everyone, for coming. I hope you'll join us um, next, uh, it's October 23rd, same time. And uh, we will have Scott Davis. And um, I hope to see everyone in person sometime soon. But if until then, we'll keep doing this on Zoom. And thank you again, Jenny, very much. It was You're great. welcome. Let's make natives the new normal. I love that. <laughs> thank you. OK, thank you. Bye. Bye.